Day 1 It began and spread with alarming speed. For years after this day, you and other survivors will try to piece together any and all information you can remember and figure out when it happened, where, or even how. Some will think it was another virus flown in on a public airline flight. Others are sure it started right here in the US. Yet others think it just happened all over the world all at once. On day one, chaos reigns in cities around the world. Many people try to flee, only to end up getting stuck in traffic or huge freeway blocking accidents and ending up as zombie bait. You're smart though. You're a devoted infographics fan after all. So you know the best thing to do if you aren't already in the outskirts of the city is to shelter in place. In case of nuclear attack, you want to get as low as possible and take shelter at the very core of a building, far from doors and windows as you can get. However, in a zombie apocalypse, it pays to have the high ground, so you'll enter the nearest high-rise and make your way up as far as you can go. Power will soon fail, and with it the elevators, which means you'll have to climb dozens of flights of stairs to get up high. But that also means a zombie will too. Barricading every door you come across, any zombie or hostile group of survivors would have to cross a gauntlet of blocked doors to get to you. And being that high up will help you avoid the attention of both zombies and marauding looters, who might arise with the collapse of civilization. Every office tower in America is going to be stocked with food and water, so you're set to ride out at least a week, maybe two, as you wait for the events to unfold below you. Maybe this is only a local event and the military will soon respond to contain the situation, or at least fly out survivors. Just in case, you make sure to get to the roof of the building and make it clear to any airplanes and helicopters that survivors are inside. It's relatively easy to set up a big SOS, using brightly colored objects looted from amongst the upper floors. Like an ancient king watching a siege of his castle from the tower, you spend the day waiting and watching as the city below you comes apart at the seams. Day 3 As predicted, not a single zombie even attempted to make the climb up to your temporary shelter. Why would they when the streets are still swimming with poorly prepared survivors, trying to make a run for it, or hiding out in bad street-level shelters? By now, it's become obvious that this is not a local event. This is it, the zombie apocalypse and the end of the world. There's been no response from the military and before the electricity died and your phone with it, the last thing you heard on social media was that the president had declared a state of emergency and taken shelter in an emergency bunker. The reason for no military response is because military bases were as overrun with the walking dead as any city. Some areas have been made secure, but there's still far too much chaos to coordinate anything more than local defense. It'll be weeks, maybe even months, before there's any major attempt to lift zombie sieges of the big cities, if it ever happens at all. There's tens of millions of the undead, and their ranks grow with every freshly slain human. You take stock of your food and water. Before the power went out, you filled up every sink, pitcher, container, even the toilets that you could find with fresh drinking water. You need water far more than you need food, though thankfully your food supply is pretty robust. Every office tower in America has multiple small kitchens, snack bars, and most even have restaurants. For the moment, food and water won't be your problem, but you can't stay here forever. Use your time wisely, so you set out rain catches on the roof of the building and keep your SOS signal free of any debris to make it clear survivors are inside. A few others from around the office building have joined in with you, and you've got the start of a small group of survivors. In a disaster, it's important to keep people occupied so they don't despair or do something stupid. So you take a leadership role and assign people tasks. The first is to fashion some kind of effective weapons and protection. You can take a cue from prison inmates and use duct tape and reams of paper to fashion some pretty sturdy body armor for yourself. Infection spreads via biting, so you make protection for your arms and legs as well. The armor can make you stiff, so you only make protection for your forearms, thighs, and chest. Just like a real soldier's body armor, you'll have to make sacrifices for mobility. No amount of body armor will stop a swarm of zombies if you're too slow or stiff to sprint or jump to safety. You fashion spears out of mops and brooms. These are great because while they won't do much lethal damage to the walking dead, they can keep them at bay pretty effectively. Sadly, there's just not much you can use for an effective weapon inside an office tower. What you really need is firearms or melee weapons that pack a punch, like baseball bats and axes. Those will have to wait. For now, it's better to avoid a fight altogether if you can help it. You place people on rotating shifts with frequent checks of the stairways that lead up to your shelter areas. In teams of threes, you start to scavenge the floors below you, being very careful with your progress to make sure you don't run into a situation where you can't quickly escape. There's a few straggler zombies up here, perhaps people who changed when the mysterious phenomenon that started this nightmare struck, and they're easy to eliminate. You aim for the head out of habit from listening to years of popular culture, but the truth is, the rest of the body is as vulnerable too. If you shatter a zombie's leg, it can't stand up on that leg anymore. If you smash its arm, it can't climb or grab you. And if you break its spine, then it's stuck on the ground for good. 
Sure, destroying the brain is good, but breaking bones makes it incredibly difficult for a zombie to actually hurt you. With your spears, though, all you can really do is pin one in place while your buddy stabs it in the head. It's a good strategy for the few you run into in the tower, but you know you'll need better weapons to survive in the streets. Luckily, before the electricity went out, you made sure to plot out the location of every gun shop, army surplus store, and police station within a few miles of you. You got a crude map and a plan. You're far ahead of the game versus other survivors. Day 7 Fires started days ago from unattended appliances, car crashes, and other minor incidents that the fire department would normally have attended to. However, nobody's putting out the fires, and it's becoming increasingly dangerous to remain in your tower shelter. Some of the group doesn't want to leave, but you explain to them that if they stay, they will inevitably burn up when the fires reach the building. There's a myriad of underground services and sewage tunnels that crisscross a modern city, and you briefly consider using one of these to get around and avoid zombies. Perhaps if you or anyone in your group actually knew anything about those tunnels, like how to get into them or where they go, it might be a good idea. The reality is, though, if you don't have the first idea of how to even get into the labyrinth-like maze under your feet, you'll just have to use the streets. The underground garage has cars, but you have no idea where to find the keys. Besides, cars will draw attention, and it's best to move silently for now. The chaos outside has died down in the last few days, as the zombie all-you-can-eat buffet ran out of easy prey. You consider when to make your move. Daytime will give you much better visibility, but it will also mean the zombies have just as good visibility for you. Instead, you opt to move at night, and make sure everyone is wearing dark clothing. Holding your spears and skirting along the edge of buildings, your first destination is a police station only four blocks away from your current location. Sticking to the shadows, you stay out of sight of most of the wandering zombies. The bulk of the walking dead have followed the initial rush of refugees out of the city. They're acting just like any predator would, simply following migrating prey. This is a relief to you, because if not, the city would be a guaranteed death trap. There is the occasional zombie you stumble into, but it's easy to overpower one or two of them at a time with your group's long spears. Arriving at the police station, though, it's obvious others had the same idea as you, as it's even been barricaded. You should have known. Luckily, the world hasn't lost all its good people because the survivors let you in. It's not nearly as safe as your high-rise tower, despite now having access to a few leftover pistols, but it's a little further away from the encroaching fires. However, it's clear to both you and the survivors already sheltering here that this isn't a place you can stay. Not only is the threat of being consumed by the raging fires growing closer every hour, but if you're going to survive long term, you need renewable food and water, neither of which you can get in the heart of the city. It's clear all of you have to leave, but the question is where? Day 9 After two days of deliberating, the group is split on how to proceed. The fires are close now, and you need to leave in the next 24 hours or risk burning to death. One group wants to head toward the nearest military base, hoping it's held out or been reclaimed. This in and of itself isn't a bad idea, but it comes with a pretty big downside. There's bound to be thousands of other people who have the exact same idea, and all you're really doing is fleeing from one large concentration of people to another, which is exactly what the zombies are also doing. If the base is held, it'll likely be very secure at this point. Shambling zombies are simply no match versus modern military weaponry, but that's a very big if at this point. You've got another idea. You've watched infographics for years, and you know one thing about zombies that nobody else does. Without their hearts pumping warm blood around their bodies, zombies can't handle cold. The moment the temperature drops to freezing, even the fastest zombie is going to be a popsicle. You try to explain that to people, that it's no different than sticking a piece of meat in the freezer, but they just don't listen to you. They're sadly too brainwashed from years of characters on TV making really stupid decisions during zombie apocalypses and not doing the obvious heading north. Agreeing to disagree, you decide to part ways. You and your group load up two police SUVs with supplies, mostly food, water, and gasoline, you siphon from other vehicles. Surprisingly, there's not much in the way of weapons or ammo left in the police station, probably because the cops who were here when the world went to hell took it with them as they acted on their own survival plans. Your goal is to get out of the city and head north. Survival depends on you getting as far north as you can go. Day 10 your two groups wish each other luck and drive in opposite directions. The streets are a mess, but you manage to navigate past wrecks and small hordes of zombies. You wisely stay off the freeways, as they're bound to be full of traffic snarls and wrecks, and instead stick to surface streets until you can make it out of the city. Day 12 You took a full 24 hours to get out of the city thanks to having to navigate so many potential roadblocks, and there was no stopping your small convoy for anything but refueling. You're taking shifts driving until you're in open country. And today, you raided the first gas station you came across for paper maps of the state and the North American freeway system. Your goal is Alaska, and you need to get there before winter comes or you could get trapped. You're tempted to loot some of the big department stores you drive past, but wisely think twice about it. Sure, they're bound to be full of supplies, but also full of zombies. 
You need to get out into more rural America before you start thinking about looting big box stores that could potentially be full of dozens of zombies. Day 15. You're making much better progress now thanks to your paper maps. You use them to avoid the freeways and use back roads, where the area is so free of signs of the apocalypse that you could almost swear it had never happened at all. But then you inevitably come across a wreck or the signs of a family having been torn apart and eaten by the walking dead. Still, you're out far enough from major population centers, you take the risk raiding a big box store. You've been mostly hitting small gas stations and convenience stores, but you really need to up your weapon game and it would help to get more food supplies. You enter the building as a team and in formation, no different than ancient Greek warriors would fight. You've been drilling like this during your rest breaks. One of the oldest forms of warfare in the world has come back, and for good reason, it works. Working together, you present a wall of spears to any zombie threat and easily hack them to pieces without letting them get near you. Those on the first row stick their spears straight out and impale zombies on them, then step aside so those in the second row can lunge forward and deliver the killing blows with axes, hammers, or similar weapons. It's brutally effective, and you see why the ancients fought like this. The number one rule of zombie warfare is to never split up. So while it would be faster for you to investigate the store as teams, you stick together. You manage to score some badly needed camping equipment, a few rifles, and loads of rounds for each. You also get practical survival equipment like fishing poles and lures. You'll need those for your new life in the cold. Speaking of which, you make sure to snatch up any cold weather gear and first aid kits you can find. Day 25 You've made decent time despite having to keep off major freeways, and it's good because fall will soon be here and the first snowfall is not long after that. You made it to Canada, where the situation is much the same as the US. This isn't a national crisis, the zombies don't respect any borders. Some of the group want to stop here, where the weather will be a little better than in frozen Alaska, but you know better. Bad weather is exactly why you're going as far north as you can. You need to stay far away from anywhere temperate for at least a year, maybe two to be safe. By that time, any reanimated flesh will have fallen apart due to decay or zombies will simply have been eaten up by wild predators. Humans kinda suck without guns, so predators like bears, cougars, and wolves will be having a field day, gorging themselves on walking corpses. Then a scary thought hits you. What if those animals become zombies too by eating zombie flesh? Or perhaps by getting bit while taking a zombie down? The thought of a zombie bear sends a chill down your spine and reinforces your decisions. You're going to Alaska for two years minimum. After that, nature should have run its course and there shouldn't be many, if any, zombies left. You continue siphoning gas from vehicles you come across and take more than you need for the trip. You don't know how many vehicles you'll encounter in rural Alaska, so you'll need plenty of gas for the future. In a dry, cool environment, gasoline can last for a few years before going bad due to oxidation, so you should be fine storing it even over the winter. You do pick up plenty of fuel stabilizer though from gas stations and mechanic shops you run across, as you'll need it for storing gasoline long term. You also grab spare tires. There's a very real risk of tire rot while vehicles are kept in storage. Just ask the Russians inside Ukraine. Day 40 The journey's been a lot slower than it would normally be using freeways, but you've managed to beat the winter to Alaska. Now it's a matter of finding a good place to shelter. Luckily, coastal Alaska is full of a lot of small resort communities or clusters of cabins for tourists to rent during the spring and summer, and the coastal waters off of Alaska are rich in all kinds of edible sea life. There's rivers everywhere which are also teeming with fish. It's the last truly untouched place in North America and life is abundant here. You pick a small cluster of cabins on the coast not too far from a river using a tourist attraction map you can find in most motels or gas stations. You also pick up plenty of canned goods that you can add to your sizable stockpile in the back of both SUVs. You never hunted before, and the last time you went fishing you were a kid. It's going to be a huge learning curve, but one that you can pick up with time. Until then, you're going to have to supplement your diet with canned goods, especially during the long, freezing winter. Humanity has thrived in every environment on Earth except Antarctica for thousands of years, though. You come from one of the greatest survival success stories in history, even if modern living has dulled your edge. If your ancestors could do it though, so can you, especially with the help of modern rifles and fishing poles. As far as the zombie threat, not only is your location remote, but as predicted when the temperature falls, the zombies you do come across in supply and scouting runs all start to slow down. Without warm blood coursing through their veins, the zombies get gradually stiffer and stiffer as the temperature plummets, and killing them is easy as smashing them into bits while they try to lunge at you in slow motion. It's going to be tough surviving up here in Alaska, but if anything ends up eating you here, it's going to be a bear, wolves, or Bigfoot, but definitely not a zombie. Now check out US military actually has a zombie plan, or click this other video instead.